गुड मॉर्निंग लर्नर्स टुडे वी विल डिस्कस द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ वेजेस एंड द थियरीज रिलेटेड टू वेजेस द फर्स्ट एंड द मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग इज टू अंडरस्टैंड एज टू वॉट डू वी मीन बाई वेजेस वेजेस आर नॉर्मली कंसिडर्ड टू बी द पेमेंट फॉर ब्लू कॉलर वर्क और मीनियल वर्क बट एक्चुअली इट इज नॉट सो इन इकोनॉमिक्स वेजेस include payment for blue collar work payment for white collar work payment for managerial jobs payment for in the form of bonus payment in the form of commission and all these things lawyers teachers doctors whatever they get all this is considered to be wages in economics so the term wages in economics incorporates the remuneration of any kind paid either to a white collar worker or to a blue collar worker so this is this this is very important to understand that the term wages uh, includes salary also royalty commission uh, and even other payments which are made to the employee by the employer now let us come to the next important concept and that is money wages or nominal wages so what do we mean by money wages money wages refer to that amount of wages which is actually paid in terms of money to a worker and whereas the term real wages real wages or nominal wages is different it's a wide term it encompasses many issues first it, it it includes purchasing power of money it's not only the money but the purchasing power of the money matters if the purchasing power of the money is low then the wages should be higher this is the concept of real wages second one is extra earnings so is there any scope of extra earnings when when uh, extra earnings is referred to it doesn't mean illegal earnings extra earnings in the form of contract in the form of agreement then nature of employment say what is the nature of employment if it is a risky nature of employment they even more wages will appear to be less like for example somebody who is working in a gas plant somebody who is working in a mine somebody who is working under hazardous conditions so there even the higher wages appear to be less so uh, money wages may be whatever but real wages will definitely be less if the work is hazardous on the other hand if the work is not so hazardous it's normal comfortable type then even the less wages will be considered to be good and sufficient similarly working hours in some profession working hours may be more and normal and in some profession working hours may be less but abnormal say night hours night shift so even working hours make the real wages appear less or more so if somebody has to work for whole of the night that means that person should get a good amount of compensation because he is working at the cost of his health now next is regularity of getting wages versus irregular wages where one gets regular wages then even less is more and where irregular wages are given then even more is less similarly expenses related to job or profession there are some professions there are some employments in which a person has to make expenditure in order to make the earning like for example lawyers they have to purchase many journals they have to contribute to reports uh, legal reports uh, this is the need of their profession similarly the doctors they also need to consult a lot of literature teachers they also need to consult a lot of literature so they buy it so the nature of their employment forces them to make expenditure for their earnings and as such even more may appear to be less 
so where if one does not incur any expenditure on earning one's income there of course uh, it, it even less may appear to be good amount now extra work without any extra money sometimes in certain jobs if you work extra then you are paid extra and in certain jobs you work extra extra and still you are not paid extra now when you you work extra and you are not paid extra uh, extra then real wages appear to be less or in other words the real wages should be more the money wages should be more so that the real wages may also appear to be significant similarly longer training periods there are some professions which require a very longer training period say for example that of a doctor or maybe that of a lawyer these are the people who have to undergo the longer training tenure and after completing that tenure only they start earning a decent amount so their money income may be more or less but real income will always be less what are the future prospects in any employment so if the future prospects are good then even one would like to continue working at low wages but if future prospects are not very clear then even higher wages might appear to be less this is the concept of real wages and monetary wages or money wages uh, in economics so money wages are stri strictly confined to the amount being received by a person by an employee by a worker by way of wages that is money wages but real wages depend upon so many factors which because of which either more amount is paid or if the less amount is received then the worker tends to move to some other profession to some other employment to some other organization to some other firm so this is the concept of money wages and real wages now we come to the theory of wages theories of wages as we noticed uh, regarding interest and regarding rent there are some old theories and there are some new theories or modern theories same is true here also even in case of wages there are some old theories most of which are not very significant it's only that a few pointers can be accepted from these theories and on the other you have the new theory or the modern theory the modern theory takes into account the demand side as well as the supply side of labor and with the help of the demand curve and the supply curve the amount of wages to be paid to labor is decided so uh, first let us begin with the older theories the older theories are usually for name sake but one must know about these the first one is wage fund theory j s mill uh, is considered to be the propounder of this theory though many people many economists contributed to this theory but j s mill has been actively associated with this theory of wages and according to this theory it is believed that a wages fund is created in a society whatever is the wages fund that will decide the amount of wages to be paid to the workers so the wages to be paid to the workers will be equal to the wage fund divided by the number of workers is equal to the rate of wages prevalent in a society at any point of time now if the wage is to be increased increased then either the wage fund should increase or the number of wage uh, labor should get reduced only in these two situations the rate of wages can be increased this is an old theory and this uh, is not uh, considered now one needs to know its name only another important theory which gives us a few inputs it's a old theory but it gives us a very important input because its name is marginal productivity theory of wages and we know that 
in distribution marginal productivity theory is very important in marginal productivity theory it is said that any factor of production is rewarded to the extent of its productivity same is here true about the wages like in case of wages whatever is the marginal productivity of labor that will decide the amount of wages and usually the wages are equal to the marginal productivity of labor uh, then the, uh, what is marginal productivity that means increase of output as a result of an increase of a single dose of labor this will be the marginal output so this is how we get to know the marginal output and marginal output tells us what should be the wages uh, one more important thing uh, to be to be uh, uh, known at this stage itself is that the demand for wages demand for labor is a derived demand because labor are demanded because of the goods which they produce and if these goods produced by the labor are in demand then labor will also be demanded so this means demand for labor is derived demand and in this theory labor will be used to that extent till which its marginal productivity is positive and the moment its marginal productivity starts getting negative more labor will not be used so that will be the point of use of labor till which its marginal productivity remains positive now as we know it, you you may say that this is the criticism of this theory that this theory discusses only one side that is the demand for labor and it does not take into account the supply side of labor how is labor supplied the supply of labor depends upon the labor and that is not being discussed in this case it talks only about the demand side then it is also very difficult to isolate the marginal productivity of labor because only labor does not make the output possible in order to make the output possible there has to be raw material there has to be infrastructure there have to be machines so everything has to be put together and then only what output can one additional dose of labor give that is known as the marginal productivity of labor so this is very difficult to isolate the marginal output of a labor then Uh, it is based it's a concept based on the perfect competition perfect competition is uh, a kind of market system which actually does not exist it's there for the sake of understanding the market systems but the truth is that this system actually does not exist why because in perfect competition it has to be assumed that the market is perfect that is there there is a large number of people who demand labor and there is a large number of workers and all these two parties are working independently all the units of labor are homogeneous and there is a perfect mobility amongst labor that is labor is ready to move from one place to another if the wages differ but actually it does not happen so perfect mobility is not possible all the units of labor are also not homogeneous some labor are very efficient and some labor are not so efficient so this is how uh, perfect competition does not exist but this concept of marginal productivity theory of wages is based on the perfect competition then there are few other old theories and it's a sufficient to know the names of these theories that is subsistence theory of wages the standard of living theory of wages and residual claimant theory of wages now having discussed this much we complete a discussion 
about the old theories of wages. So in the old theories of wages, what we find of relevance is the marginal productivity theory of wages, which gives us one clue about the determination of wages. And that is the wages are demanded because they have productivity. The demand for labor is a derived demand. And whatever products are being manufactured with the help of labor, these products are in demand in the market. And as a result, the demand for labor is a derived demand. And that is how the demand for labor takes place. So we get this learning from the marginal productivity theory. Now we come to the modern theories. And here, first we will discuss the determination of wages under the conditions of perfect competition. Here, as I said earlier, in the modern theories, we discuss both the sides. That is the demand side and the supply side. So as we have discussed a little earlier while discussing the marginal productivity theory of labor, we have noticed that labor is demanded by producers of things, producers of different items for manufacturing those items for manufacturing those things. So they demand labor. Why they demand labor? Because labor has got productivity. So labor will be used till its revenue productivity is positive. If marginal revenue productivity of labor is more than the wages, then more wages, more labor will be demanded. And if marginal revenue productivity of labor will be equal, will be less than the uh, wages, then less workers will be demanded. And ultimately, there will come a point when marginal productivity of labor will be equal to the margin, uh, equal to the wages. This is the idea of determination of wages in this case. So uh, the demand curve for labor is a negatively sloping line because when the wages are high, more wages are, more labor are uh, available and when the, no this is the supply side, demand for labor will depend on the price of other factors also with which the labor is used. Demand for labor may also depend on the technical condition. Say what is the ratio in which it is being used. So depending upon these factors, there will exist inverse relationship between wages and demand for labor. At high wages, less workers will be demanded. At less wages, more workers will be demanded. Now we come to the, this is how the demand side of labor is created. It's a negatively sloped curve, sloping downwards from left to right. Now we come to the supply side of labor. The supply of labor, that is wages and the supply, these are directly related to each other. As the wages increase, more and more labor are ready to work. But in this case, what we notice is that there are two effects. One is substitution effect and another one is income effect. Substitution effect is positive. Uh, uh, substitution effect is positive and income effect is, in this case is negative. Now, what is that substitution effect? Say initially when the wages are increased, then the labor tend to work more. They work more. They substitute more work for more wages. And as a result, the curve slopes upwards with a positive slope in the positive direction. But there is a negative effect also. If the wages go on increasing, then after some time, the income of the workers also increases. So when the income of the workers increases, then what happens is they start preferring leisure 
to work. Meaning thereby, when the income increases, there is income effect. And on account of this income effect, they do not want to work more. So this is negative income effect. So what we find with the supply curve of labor is that initially there is substitution effect which is positive. So more the wages, more the workers are available and they work more. And gradually when the wages are increased, then income of the labor also increases. The negative income effect starts working and what happens is that the curve slightly tilts towards the y-axis. And the fact that the curve tilts to the y-axis, that means even if more wages are given, less workers are available. Though initially, if more wages are given, more workers are available. So now we have these two sides. One is the demand side of labor and another one is the supply side of labor. Both these curves put together, they give us the equilibrium point and at this equilibrium point the wages are determined. Say for example if we call this point E then at this point E marginal revenue productivity of labor should be equal to wages paid to labor. At any other point this is not possible. Now I will show it to you with the help of a diagram. In diagram 1, we may call this figure 1, we may call this figure 2, and we may call the last one figure 3. So, in figure 1, what we notice is that the demand curve is a negatively sloping curve. Negatively sloping curve showing relationship between the wage rate and the quantity of labor. Say when wage is OW, then ON quantity of labor is being demanded. When wage comes down, more labor are being demanded. So as the wages come down, more and more labor are demanded by the market. On the other hand, let us look at the supply side. In the supply side, as I had explained a little earlier, this is the positively sloping line. But there comes a point when it starts tilting towards this y-axis. So SS has got a typical shape that, shape that initially it is a positively sloping line showing that at less wages, less workers are available at more wages, more workers are available. Say, let us say, OQ labor are available if the wages are OW. If the wages are increased to W1, then OQ1 labor are available. And you may notice that it goes on increasing, it goes on increasing till this is W2, this is W3 and this is W4. But you will notice that Beyond this point, the curve starts getting an inflection towards y-axis. So at W3, you will notice that there is no change from the earlier quantity of labor demanded, though the uh, wages have increased. There is an increase in wages, but more labor are not ready to work because they are now preferring leisure to work. And if you give still more wages, say W4, then you notice that even less workers are available to work uh, at this price. So what happens in the supply side of labor is that initially there is a positive substitution effect and later when the curve starts turning towards y-axis, then this is the negative income effect. Negative inf income effect means workers, they have more income and with that more income they want to relax. They do not want to work that much. So as a result this curve shifts upwards. And what is the result? That at more wages 
less workers are available more workers are not, not available so this is the demand side this is the supply side and both these curves are put into one diagram that is figure 3 and here we get to know that at ow wages on workers are demanded and as i said a little earlier that this ow wages and O n number of workers, this is equal to the marginal revenue productivity of the labor. At any other point, this will not be possible. Let me show it with the help of an example. Say if for example, wages increase to W1. W1. So here you will notice that this line touches the demand curve and the supply curve at two different points say one is a the other one is b and you will notice that demand is less and supply is more demand for workers is less and supply of workers is more so when demand is less and supply is more the prices are the wages are bound to fall down and the equilibrium shall ultimately be restored at this point only which is known as E. If we take a reverse action, let us say we put it here W2 and we try to draw a line from this point towards the demand curve and the supply curve. Then we notice that these, this line crosses supply curve at C and demand curve at D. So what do we have? Less of supply and more of demand. So when supply is less, demand is more, that means wages will have a tendency to rise upwards. They will go up, go up and get restored at E only. So E is such an ideal point where marginal revenue productivity of labor MRP of labor is equal to wages. That means this OW wages which is being paid to the labor, to the worker the revenue productivity is also equivalent to that only. So this is how uh, under the, uh, I mean, the prices, uh, the wages are determined with the help of the demand force and the supply force. Now, in the next diagram, we will understand this situation in perfect competition. In perfect competition, uh, there may be three situations one there may be uh, wages may be more than the marginal revenue productivity wages may be less than the marginal productivity and wages may be equal to the marginal productivity so the trader may either have abnormal profits trader may either have normal profits and trader may also go in for losses now, if we look at the demand side, on the demand side, what we notice in perfect competition is that supply is given at a point of time. Nobody is able to influence the supply. Individual firm cannot do anything with it. Whatever is the price fixed by the demand conditions, say the demand changes D1, D2, D3, there are three demand levels. With these three demand levels, a wage line will be created which shall be a horizontal line uh, parallel to x-axis. We will see that with the help of the diagram. Now under perfect competition, what is happening in the labor market is that the supply line is given. There is no change in supply during a period of time. And in this period of time, it is only the demand of labor which is deciding the wages. Say for example, if the demand is DD, then wages will be decided at point E. If demand is D1, D1, 
wages will be decided at E1 and if the demand is D2, D3, wages will be decided at E2. So the wages go on increasing as the demand increases, there is no change in supply. The supply is given in the definite period in the short run. Now, if we extend the same equilibrium point to the next diagram, then we, what we get to know is that is the wage line. A, B is the wage line. This is the wage line of one equilibrium. The A1, B1 is the wage line of the second equilibrium and A2, B2 is the wage line of the third equilibrium. Meaning thereby, the individual trader cannot influence the wages. He has to take the wages as decided by the industry. Whatever are the wages decided by the industry, those wages are accepted by the individual traders. And this line tells us that individual trader is not in a position to influence the wages. Rather, individual trader accepts the wages as decided by the industry with the help of the supply line and the three demand lines. So this may be either A, B or it may be A1, V1 or it may be A, A2, B2. So now we know the demand side. The demand side is known to us. This is the, uh, this is the uh, wage line which is known to us. We know the wage line. At this wage line, average revenue and marginal revenue both are equal. And now we have to decide about the average revenue productivity and marginal revenue productivity of labor. So with the help of average revenue productivity and marginal revenue productivity of labor, the equilibrium shall be decided. So keep this diagram in mind because this diagram shall be used in a later analysis also. Now we move on to the next diagram which depicts the average revenue productivity of labor and marginal revenue productivity of labor and these two are uh, put on each other. That is the wage line is given and on the wage line, given wage line you have the marginal revenue productivity and average revenue productivity and that decides the equilibrium as well as the profit. So the next diagram. So, in this diagram, what we notice is that AB is the wage line as we determined earlier. On this wage line, average wages are equal to the marginal wages. Average wages are equal to the marginal wages. And then we have these revenue productivity curves of labor. The revenue productivity curves of labor have got that standard shape wherein initially it rises, rises, goes till a point and then the law of diminishing returns starts operating and as a result it starts coming down and goes down. On the other hand, the marginal revenue line starts from above the average revenue productivity line and crosses the ARP as per the natural behavior of MRP, it crosses from the uppermost point of ARP and goes down below the ARP. So as we know from the equilibrium studies that equilibrium will be established where AR is equal to MR. So this is the point where average wages and marginal revenue productivity and average revenue both are equal. So this is the point equilibrium at this point what happens is MRP is equal to average wages is equal to marginal wages. All these are equal. Therefore, this is the point of equilibrium. But what will be uh, the amount of wages? That will be decided with the help of the average revenue product line. 
So we extend this line a little up and it meets at point F. So we draw a perpendicular line from F on Y axis and it meets at point G. So now what do we get? Quantity of labor is OQ. Wages decided are EW or AO. But the revenue productivity received is FQ. So profit is revenue minus wages. That means FQ minus FE. That means this FE area, this is the area of profit. This entire shaded portion shows the profit of the firm if this is the shape of the curves. So under perfect competition, what is happening is that wage line is given. On this given wage line, we have average revenue and marginal revenue as equal. The both are equal. And the equilibrium point shall be decided where the marginal revenue product curve will cross this line. This is E, where it is decided. And from this point only, uh, we decide the wages and we decide the profit. So this is one situation under perfect competition. In another situation, there may be losses. In the third situation, there may be normal profits. So we will show all these two situations in two more diagrams. Now we have these two more situations under perfect competition. In figure one, loss has been depicted. And how has this loss been depicted? Let us look at it. The wage line is as usual, a straight line, perfectly elastic, where average wages and marginal wages are equal. No individual firm is able to influence the wages uh, in the short run. Then what happens is that we have the average revenue productivity curve of labor. We have denoted it by ARP. Then we have the MRP which starts from above the ARP and crosses the ARP from its highest point. But wherever the MRP and wage line they touch each, each other, that is the point of equilibrium. And from E, if you say this point is F, so what is the amount of wages? The wages have been decided. This is the wages EW, and this is the productivity, revenue productivity of wages. The revenue productivity is how much? FQ. And the wages being paid are E. W. So there is a loss and this loss has been denoted by this dotted area. Let us see this is A, B, F, E. Similarly, in this diagram, you will notice that ARP has been drawn in such a manner that its upper limit touches the wage line. As usual, MRP will cross from its highest point. So this is E. But at this point, you notice that everything is equal. At this point, everything is equal. What is it? That is AW, MW, ARP, and MRP all are equal. And the fact that all are equal, this is the situation of normal profit only. This is known as zero profit or normal profit. Whereas this is the situation of loss. So we have noticed three situations under perfect competition in the short run. One is profit, other one is loss and usually what does one get is the normal profit. Normal profit is also known as zero profit. But it means that some normal amount is being received. Why? Because this is the characteristic of perfect competition. In perfect competition, 
if excess profits are received then more firms will have a tendency to enter into this trade more firms will come into business supply will increase and when the supply is increases that means the profit will be distributed amongst the more firms and if there are losses then what will happen many firms will leave the industry they will go out so the supply will get restored to the normal situation so usually what happens is that in the short run one may get either the profits or the losses but what is the usual situation in the perfect competition it is that of the normal profits so that is all about this discussion of wages under perfect competition we'll continue this discussion regarding the determination of wages under the conditions of imperfect competition thank you